Dit was een muzikaal intro van Adita. En we gaan met hem praten. Het spirituele pad kent vele varianten. Je kunt yoga doen, je kunt mediteren en daarbij kun je een traditie kiezen. Een van de oudste tradities is de Vedische traditie. Dat is gebaseerd op de Veda's. Boeken die duizenden jaar geleden in India geschreven zijn. Een van de mensen die in het Westen probeert om die Vedische traditie uit te dragen, maar dan in een dynamische westerse vorm is Sri Chinmoy. Hij is erg bekend, maar hij heeft ook een aantal volgelingen. Eén van hen is Adita 
En Adita was de afgelopen week in Nederland. En we spreken met hem over zijn werk, zijn muziek. Want net als Sries in Mooi is hij geïnteresseerd in muziek. En voert dat ook uit. En wat yoga en meditatie inhoudt. Mm-hmm. Welkom Adita. Hallo. Hi. You are not like uh, Sries in Mooi from Indian origin. You're right. actually European. Where do you come from? I'm Austrian. I come from Salzburg in Austria. And you are a follower, uh, a student of Sri Moy for yes. how many years? 15 years now. That's quite a long time because you look like 30, 35, so, so 33 years. 33 <laughs> years. So you follow this master as you since s- I'm 18 years old. And how did it happen? Did you meet him in the street or did you oh, go well. to a lecture? <laughs> <laughs> It's very difficult to find masters in European streets. So I checked out many, many uh, paths and uh, forms of mystic practice in my teenager years. And uh, one day I've, I came across a lecture in Salzburg of a student of Sri Chinmoy from Switzerland. And actually he was not telling much new things that I didn't know already. But then there was a meditation exercise and he sang the Om in a way I had never heard before. Suddenly it was becoming infinite everything. And I thought, wow, now finally something is really happening. And that uh, got me first hooked that I felt, well, that could be something for me. Mm-hmm. And then you you started using this meditation or this, this own practice. Right. And when did you then first met Sri Chinmoy? I met Sri Chinmoy one and a half years uh, later. He gave a big uh, meditation concert in Cologne in Germany, Cologne. Mm-hmm. And um, there again I had quite an interesting experience. Before I came to the concert I was walking on the river Rhine and it was like one and a half hours before the concert and suddenly the Rhine is not only to my left side but also to my right side and suddenly above me, below me and I felt like completely dissolving. I I lost my my, my physical consistence and my consciousness was only flowing with the river and it's got like 10-15 minutes. I just stood still and then it, it, it got, it calmed down a little bit and then I felt wow that's amazing. It happens even before I see him. And then during the concert, I was really silent. It was the first time in my life I experienced absolutely no thoughts. And that's something uh, you try to reach with meditation techniques. I mean, it's one of the basis, of course, of meditation, to stop the inner dialogue, like Carlos Castaneda calls it. And uh, in the case of a master who has this inner silence himself, it can happen by induction, inducti, you can say, that he transmits in a way such a state of consciousness. And so this was the first time I saw him and actually much more important than to see him, to feel the spiritual power. It was not the words that he said, it was the, the radiation of his presence. Exactly, because he didn't say that um, quite a few masters, they don't say very much in Sri Chinmoy. Sometimes he just talks about tennis, for example, or modern daily life things. Or he, he tells a few old Indian stories, but it's not like that you think, well, you sit uh, at the feet of the master and you get instructions. But it's basically very fresh and we do a lot of sports and meditation and music and theater. So it's uh, not the traditional way you like. You would produ- uh, practice it in Rishikesh when you're in an ashram in Rishikesh, for mm-hmm. example. But this kind of illustrates that these messages are not messages of the mind or of knowing. Yes. They are messages of the heart. Yes, exactly. Because the mind has different cultures. We have a Western culture, we have an Eastern culture, we have different philosophies, different avenues of the mind, we can say. But in the heart, people, and that I experience also when I go to Eastern Europe nowadays or to South America, North America, in the heart, the moment you can touch people in the heart, you feel they all have a heart. And in the heart, if we can speak the language of the heart, we are all brothers and sisters. We're all one. Yes. Now tell me a little bit more about Sri Chinmoy. He is now 65 years old. He's very, uh, well, he's a music composer, he's a teacher, but he's also an athlete. He, he believes in physical exercise and right. that's quite unusual for yeah. Indian people. <laughs> yes, uh, especially. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how come? Is that 
his his way of coping with the stress of the West? I think, yeah, I think he right from the beginning he knew that he had the task also to teach in the West and the West being a very dynamic civilization. Even if you use the methods of Hatha Yoga or Tai Chi, they can calm you down, but then still many people have this uh, difficulty of tuning in again into the dynamic flow of the Western consciousness. And Sri Chinmo himself says uh, it's actually better for someone who, who is, uh, has a regular job here in our civilization or has a family to do some dynamic form of body discipline, like running, for example, or swimming, but still uh, to do it in a meditative way. That mm -hmm. means by meditating before on it and then really watching your breath while you're running or while you're swimming. Mm -hmm. Because the breath is also in meditation always a very important uh, instrument. Now Sri Chinmoy is a, he comes from a, the Vedic tradition, which is very old, uh, very Indian. Mm -hmm. um, how does it relate to doing sports? I mean, I, I don't remember, except some <laughs> warfare in, like... Uh, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, where they're always right. running around they and, and fighting. fighting. <laughs> <laughs> fighting but yes. um, in the Vedas, there's there's not much about uh, doing aerobics, for instance. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely right. And there's one thing called uh, the Sanatana Dharma, the eternal truth, and that actually never changes. The absolute consciousness never changes. But on the other hand, here we have in the relative, in the uh, manifested creation, we have an evolution going on. That means if you practice now according, uh, exactly according to what was true 5,000 years ago, mm -hmm. you're a little bit out of time. You're a little bit uh, not corresponding to the time spirit, to the tight haste, I think mm -hmm. you call it. So I think it has to do with that also, that our consciousness has to adapt on the outer level to what is there, to the challenges that are there outwardly, though inwardly, of course, the eternal truth, that remains the same to be realized. Now, the doctors tell us that uh, doing a lot of sport uh, and you know getting doing exercise brings the level of serotonin which is like the happiness drug in our mind mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. so it seems to be like a logical relationship between doing exercise and feeling well but the same serotonin seems to happen when you do meditation or yes all these things so there is a similarity there yes yes i mean it's a big uh, circle it's the body of a human being the emotions the thoughts and the higher parts, the psychic and the spiritual spheres, and they all interrelate with each other. There's feedback between them. That means when we can reach an optimal state or an enthusiastic, um, um, energetic and still peaceful state, then uh, it's, it has an effect on our mind, it has an effect on our heart, our emotions, but also on the body. And actually, um, Running or sports is a good stress relief, if you want to call it just like this. On the other hand, it does something more, it makes you more solid. So even I myself am running marathons, so you maybe notice that I'm not the perfect sportsman. But the main oh, thing... It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, the main thing is to, to keep a certain stability, because also again in the meditation, you um, receive the farther you go, the more years you meditate, the higher energies you receive. You become, um, you become open to higher and higher energies. And then it's very important to have a strong physical also. If you look at, for example, Christian mystics of the past, they often had these mystic diseases or even uh, experiencing nearly death experience. And also shamans were going through very, very hard, um, uh, how you can call it, very, very hard tests of their physical frame. And in the integral yoga, so Sri Chinmoy and before him already Sri Aurobindo said that it's very important also to make the physical frame, the physical vessel, vehicle strong so that it can become attuned with the higher frequencies and that it can hold them safely without cracking down. So some of these stories are that you have to allow the Kundalini to the energy to go mm -hmm. through your body, but mm -hmm. in order to do that spasmic Things can happen, and if you are weak and unhealthy, that's not yes. very... Because the thing is, we have energy channels all over, not only the Kundalini, and the Kundalini can no, there's safely... there's a whole system of nadis, of, of, yes, exactly. of channels, and so we have to take good care. But that's an old story. Uh, that's an old story, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not easy to take care of them. Yeah. Because, Minsana and uh, Purpurasana. Right, yes. <laughs> exactly. So, um, Sri Aurobindo once said, uh, all life is yoga. 
That means not only when you sit and meditate, but actually whatever you do, um, if you lose the consciousness, if you, um, for example, get undisciplined in your thoughts and fall into very negative thoughts, or if your emotions sometimes become very angry or very stressed, then this immediately destroys something of the nadis, of these subtle energy channels, because they are very, very fine. And not even physical misuse can uh, be destructive, but even negative emotional frequencies or negative mental frequencies. So actually we are like a big laboratory, human laboratory, till the, how it's called in the, in the Jewish tradition, till the divine Jerusalem is established, the golden city of the divine inside us. And that's quite a challenging discipline, especially nowadays. And so it was easier, you can say in earlier times, uh, when people were just retreating in a monastery or in a cave. On the other hand, you need to be extremely tough in the mind to survive that for a few years. You, you are jumping to the Jewish tradition, some other traditions. Mm -hmm. How do you see the differences? Uh, obviously, you follow the, this Vedic yes. tradition, which is a Hindu kind of, of, of uh, basic belief system. Right. Still with a one God idea behind mm -hmm. it, maybe in many forms. But mm -hmm. how do you see different religions, like the Jewish tradition with a more paternal, uh, hierarchical yes. God, a more yes. vertical God? Uh, uh, there, there are many traditions. Do you see them as, as, as different forms of the same? Or? Yes, I mean, you can say like this, that they are all houses or temples, but they are under the same sky. So the sky is God, it's the absolute consciousness. But the ways of, of worship, they happen in different houses. And some people say, oh, I like this temple more. Some people say, this is my house. Here I feel at home. And some people even, they just want to be under the blue sky. So there, there are many forms, but finally it all happens under the same umbrella, you can say. So you don't believe there are different gods that we, we all... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the human beings sometimes believe that. That causes a lot of troubles. But... Um, on the level of mystic experience, and I had also encounters with Buddhists and also with uh, uh, quite a few Christian um, priests who were also in touch with India, and even Indian Christian priests, and they say all, on the level of mysticism, all religions are one. On the level of the dogma, they're all different and sometimes start to fight, but on the level of the inner experience, of the mystic experience, they all can be experienced as one. And there are also people stop to fight and actually love starts. Mm -hmm. Love and peace and real friendship. You give uh, lectures and exercises and you did that in Amsterdam mm -hmm. with your music, which yes. you just heard. Uh, but you also do teach yoga, uh, doing those things. What kind of yoga do you teach? It's um, basically all kinds of yoga because the wisdom yoga, the jnana yoga or jnana yoga is very important. We need differentiation. On the other hand, the yoga of love, the bhakti yoga, is very important also because if we have only the, the wisdom, the light aspect, then we can become cold. The heart gives us the warmth. On the other hand, if we have only the heart and we don't develop our wisdom, then our love can become a little bit foolish and go in the wrong directions. But then again, there is a third path in the, in the basic ancient yoga systems, and that is the karma yoga. That's the yoga of action. That's actually that you don't hang around and do nothing, but you use actually your situation. You're here with a body, you have an energy, and you have to use it somehow. If you don't use it, then you become used by your lethargy or by other people. So this is, again, the third um, integrative factor of what Sri Chinmoy calls the integral yoga that actually, if we live in this society, we need wisdom, we need love, plus we need the power to act, and to act in a non-egoistic way if possible. Yeah, now this karma yoga, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in the center, someone has to clean the toilet to do the bar jobs <laughs> and stuff, you know, and then we say, okay, this is karma yoga, this is what you have to do because it's your service. Right. Um, but does that go as far as saying, it is, like in your case, what you do, you go around the world and you teach and you, becoming a person in yourself, uh, yeah. um, that's what in the West we would say is an ego-boosting activity. Exactly. Um, is that also karma yoga or is that a dangerous kind of yes. being in the world? You are absolutely right. This is exactly the challenge that karma yoga, especially when you get out, go out and appear in front of others, you have to take very much care. Then again, you need your love and humility towards other beings and you need your wisdom to see, well, where am I getting maybe arrogant or complacent about myself? 
and w when I'm uh, really surfing selflessly. So this is exactly why the Karma Yoga needs the love and needs the wisdom also. But even then, it doesn't happen all at once. You need years and years. And I cannot tell you how many mistakes I have made, probably. But the main thing about mistakes is you don't give up. You take each mistake as a learning experience and then you say, okay, now this I have learned, I don't want to do it again and again, always the same thing. I want to make new mistakes I've never made before. And maybe finally come to a, a level where I make no more mistakes anymore, if that is possible. So this is what I feel about uh, doing practical karma yoga now for the last 12 years, to learn out of the wrong experiences and to try to go on and not repeat the mistakes. Adita, thank you for your explanation. Thank you very much. Mensen die wat meer willen weten over Shichin Moi, daar is een, uh, zijn geregeld bijeenkomsten. U kunt daarvoor bellen met 020-618-9350 of 070-3624-850. En komende dinsdag en donderdag zijn er weer bijeenkomsten in Amsterdam. Thank you. Thank you very much.